welcome to the Lowenstein Sandler podcast series. I'm Amanda Zamers, Director of Marketing at Lowenstein Sandler. Before we begin, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast series at lowenstein.com backslash podcasts, or you can find us on Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Audible, iHeartRadio, Spotify, SoundCloud, or YouTube. Now let's take a listen. Welcome to Don't Take No for an Answer. I'm your host, Linda Bennett, Chair of the Insurance Recovery Practice here at Lowenstein Sandler. And today I'm very pleased to be joined by Yelena Donayaski, a Senior Vice President and Partner at Woodruff Sawyer, as well as my colleague, Heather Weaver, who's counsel in the insurance group here at Lowenstein as well. And today we've gathered to talk about the current state of SPAC-related litigation and its impact on the insurance market. Yelena, you recently published an interesting article on this topic, and we thought it would be fun to have you come on back on the show. So you're a repeat guest, and we're pleased to have you. We wanted to flesh out some of the details of your report with you live. So thanks for joining us today, Yelena. Yeah, pleasure to be here, and thanks for having me back. And Heather, thank you for joining us as well. Always fun to pair up with one of my insurance recovery crew. Thanks for joining. And that's nice to meet you with Yelena. So why don't we start by, Yelena, you telling our listeners what that SPAC acronym stands for and how SPACs are used in corporate transactions such as mergers and acquisitions. Sure, sure. So SPAC stands for a special purpose acquisition company. And what it really does is it's a team of folks with financial expertise that get together and essentially raise funds for a future acquisition of an operating company. So it is a blank check company in a sense that for typically two years has a two year search period at the end of which they find a suitable target operating company, merge with it, and through this process, take that private company. So I want to portal us back to 2020 when we were all thinking about the pandemic and lockdown and social distancing and all of those phrases that we were very familiar with. SPAC has been around for quite a long time, but it seems like that's when it really splashed across the headlines. And there was an awful lot of money floating around for these types of special organizations, as you just described. So what's happened since 2020, when there was a lot of money sloshing around and we had a lot of celebrities throwing their names behind some of these SPACs. Right. What's happened since then? What happened to all the money? What happened to the groups that got together to, to look at these new kind of business models? So yeah, there's definitely been a shift in the market, but I want to point out that SPACs have been around for a much longer time than 2020. They've actually been around for at least a couple of decades and have gone through a couple of cycles where they were popular and then unpopular. By 2020, 21, that's when sort of the frenzy that you mentioned is what we witnessed. I think it was driven a lot by some of the more household names that entered the SPAC market and took some of targets private. One of them was Virgin Galactic, and it caused an interest in the space. And then the general market conditions were such there was interest from sponsors to get these kinds of vehicles together, interest from investors to get them together, celebrities got involved, and it really kind of went a little too crazy. And many of the veterans in the SPAC world that I talked to and have been in the SPAC world since the beginning, they all admit to it. It just went wild. It was a wild, wild west. And I think a portion of it was driven by the fact that this vehicle is essentially an alternative to a traditional IPO. And it was sold at some point as an easier or maybe shorter, or less contentious way to get to a public company space. And that's what happened. This is an easy way to get to an IPO. And I'm going to do it this way. And of course, you know, as a result, some of the teams that chose this, it became a lawyer's dream, right? So you had money sloshing around. You had a lot of people doing a lot of things quickly, looking for ways around regulations. This sounds like a plaintiff's lawyer, absolute, yeah, thing, right? So the lawsuits filed, right? There were a few bad apples, <laughs> absolutely. I and mean, some of those companies that went public shouldn't have gone public. They were just not ready for it. That's true. Right. So money gets put out there, not a lot of regulation around it. And now the plaintiff lawyers and a number of these SPAC transactions failed, right? 
Right. So a number of them did fail. Sponsors lost millions of dollars because they put up considerable two, three, four, five billion dollars to get these vehicles going. Investors, I want to point out, didn't really lose any money because the way that the SPAC vehicle works is if the deal doesn't go forward, they get their shares back. There's a redemption mechanism. But there was frenzy around trading and Obviously, there was room for lawsuits. So we did see a number of securities class actions that came out of the space. And I'm happy to talk about what we're seeing right now. But the situation has changed. You asked like where we are in in connection with the 2021. That has frenzy had died down in 2022. 23 was very, very quiet. Nobody could get money, right? (laughs) No one, you know, the SPAC sponsors got so burned and lost so much money that no one wanted to launch new vehicles, new SPAC IPOs, and they were all still trying to get their deals done and ran out of viable targets to buy. So 23 was very, very quiet. But I'm just back from the annual SPAC conference from a couple of weeks ago, and I can tell you that the mood is very, very positive. There's a lot of buzz about mostly experienced SPAC sponsors coming back into the market. And the reason that's happening is also wider economic change in the market where the interest rates are not where they used to be. There's some tweaks to the SPAC structure, not huge tweaks, but enough to cause sponsors to come back to the table and investors to come back to the table. And you have to also look at SPACs as a subset of general IPO market. And the IPOs generally, as you know, have been very, very few and far between. So that's what's happening right now. So your article talks about it's not gloom and doom. You just kind of laid the groundwork for that. So you think that the SPAC market's going to come back. People are going to take some lessons learned, but but come back and continue to use that vehicle. Yes, I think so, because it's a one done correctly and not being abused and done with the disclosure that it's required to have with the sophisticated advisors that are required for this process, taking a company public, it is a very good alternative to a traditional IPO and it works very, very well for some of the industries. So also a lot of the people have learned from previous mistakes. They've seen how the litigation played out in the securities class action, some of the fiduciary duty cases in Delaware. I'm happy to talk about those as well. That's a trend that we noted in the SPAC notebook. That's monthly blog posts that I write, but focused on SPAC risk. And so people have learned from those mistakes, and I think they're going to be able to do things better going forward. So I'm not anticipating the same numbers in 2021 as we saw in 2021 going forward, but I think there's going to be a healthy market in the SPAC vehicle from now on. And I can tell you, you know, last couple of weeks, I got eight, nine calls about DNO coverage for new SPAC IPOs compared to almost no calls over the last year, year and a half. Well, that is good news because when there's DNO coverage in place and lawsuits follow, what happens? <laughs> <laughs> That's when we need you to come in. <laughs> right. So before we dive into the coverage that'll be available and Heather will take us through that, Just give us an idea of the kind of lawsuits that you've seen over the last couple of years. What are the nature of the claims? You mentioned a couple of important decisions out of Delaware. So give us the overview of when the transaction goes wrong. What's the nature of the relief that's being sought? And what are you seeing the courts doing there to kind of keep appropriate guardrails up? Yeah, so that's an excellent question, right? So We saw securities class actions, not as many as you would think. And actually, the number has kind of steadied out around 20, 24, 27 over the last three years. We're likely to see more of them. But what I thought was really interesting, especially this past year, is a focus on fiduciary duty cases in Delaware. And we saw an uptick in those and their progeny of multi-plan and the key that which essentially is a case that Delaware decided to get the SPAC and a lot of similar kinds of complaints followed. And this was in 21, 22. And so now there's a whole slew of these multi-plan progeny cases out in, in Delaware. And Delaware has been fairly negative in its treatment of SPACs. 
So a lot of the plaintiffs decided to switch gears and go from filing securities class actions into doing fiduciary duty cases in Delaware, which is interestingly enough, is now pushed a lot of the new SPACs out of Delaware. None of them are now incorporating in Delaware. They're all going to Cayman and market conditions are different. But the kinds of cases, and I have some data here that we keep at Woodruff Sawyer, 86% are centered around misleading or fraudulent disclosures about a product. 59% are misrepresentation of revenue or growth. 40% deceptive or fraudulent disclosures. 36% accounting issues. And 16% lowering of guidance or outlook. So those are the types of claims that come through. And of course, the DNO policy would respond to these kinds of claims. Yeah, Heather. So why don't you comment on that? When we get the lawsuit in, DNO is obviously the the main policy, but what are some of the things that folks need to be thinking about when they get that lawsuit and how are the insurance companies going to respond? Yeah, well, I, I think there's a few considerations to think about here, as always, whether your actual policy will cover a particular lawsuit or investigation will, of course, depend on the terms of your policy and the claims at issue. And in this area in particular, I think it's important to work with an experienced broker or coverage counsel because of the complexity of SPAC transactions. I think it's created the need to better understand the intricacies of DNO you know, coverage and what a particular company might need. So for example, my understanding is typically DNO you know, insurance will be needed for the different entities right involved in this life cycle of SPAC. So the original SPAC shell company coverage there in connection with raising capital and acquisition activities. Then we want to make sure there's adequate coverage for the private target company that will merge with SPAC and then they're surviving post-merger companies. And so I think one thing to keep in mind for policyholders is to make sure that there's adequate DNO coverage for alleged wrongful acts occurring up until the closing, right? And then once the merger takes place, you want to make sure that back has a tail or runoff policy to cover claims made during the time period following the transaction for wrongful acts that took place before the transaction closed and making sure that there's go forward coverage for the surviving entity. And I'd love to hear, Elena, what types of exclusions you're seeing, but I would think that it would be important to look for you know, securities exclusions, prior acts exclusions, things like that, things to be aware of when purchasing DNO insurance. And I'm sure as the risk of these back litigations go up, insurers are looking to include more and more exclusion. But Perhaps if things are looking up, as you suggest, maybe the market will soften in that regard a little bit. Yeah, no, so that's absolutely important to look at. I I totally agree. I just also want to point out that while it is important to make sure that the TL coverage is there, there's been a new structure in the market that we've actually used at Woodruff Sawyer and we pioneered where we have coverage, a couple what we call a combined policy for post-merger, all of the entities involved which creates a prior tax coverage for the DNO of the original SPAC, thereby eliminating the need for the tail. And so while that coverage still needs to be in place, you need coverage for those DNOs. There's different ways of approaching it through either a tail separately or through a prior act with a combined entity. And I have more information on that if anyone's interested. But in terms of exclusions, I am not seeing really exclusion. I mean, these policies are looking very much like a traditional public company DNO policy would. So while it's definitely important to make sure that you don't have exclusions for security issues and things like that, that is sort of the structuring element of it is takes more time than worrying about the kinds of exclusions that are being imposed, except for one element, which I've seen in my practice, where some of the companies, foreign companies coming from different jurisdictions, sometimes work with brokers or insurers that are not US-based or not knowledgeable in US SPAC world. And sometimes I've seen securities exclusions in those. And essentially, that's incredibly problematic. And I feel like that's something that just non-knowledgeable players in this market are doing and are hurting their insureds and their clients who are not aware that securities 
matters are what needs to be covered by these policies. Yeah, it's music to our ears that you've got the combined policy because what we've seen in some of these these spac is you've got two or three different carriers and you get the claim in, you get the finger pointing game that nobody and capacity issues and all of that. So good on Woodrow Sawyer for coming up with the uh, hack around that. So before we wrap up, let's just touch on, as you said, the market is starting to come back. People are dipping their toe back in the water on these SPAC transactions. The DNO insurers are going to be happy to jump in and issue policies, collect premiums there. What are we looking at in terms of pricing and perhaps is it the usual suspects in the market or do you have new entrants into this market? Why don't you touch on that before we wrap up? Yeah, that's a great question. So as you probably know, the general public company DNO market has softened considerably over the last year or so. And so we're definitely not seeing the pricing that we were seeing in 21, which was exorbitant and ridiculous, if you ask me. And that was a really hard conversations to have with my clients. Now the market has done a 180 degree flip, which is excellent for my clients, much lower pricing and the insurers are fighting for those premium dollars. So we're seeing that reflected not only in the traditional DNO public company space, but also in SPACs. There are a few carriers that are the ones that have been in the market forever and they're able to offer primary coverage. Some new entrants into the market, but I, having dealt with them recently, my sense is that they don't really understand the SPAC dynamics yet very well because the, based on the questions that they're asking. So I think they need a little bit of time to kind of get up to speed on how this actually works. But once they get there, there's going to be additional capacity in the market. But generally speaking, the DNO market right now is very favorable for SPACs. And the pricing is somewhere for doing 5 million coverage for the, the SPAC IPO, somewhere in the 200 250 to 75 range for a side A only. And again, that goes into how you structure and what you should be doing and how the SPAC risk is looking. But it's very, very different from the numbers that we were seeing, which were four or five, six times that in 2021. Well, one thing has come through loud and clear to me in today's episode, which is you need to have a specialized broker who really knows the SPAC market inside and out. And you certainly are someone that if I were in the market looking, I'd give a call to because you have your thumb on uh, the risk that's out there and how to beat up those insurance companies to get good coverage (laughs) at the right price. So I want to thank you very much for joining us today. Interesting to watch this market continuing to evolve. And uh, we'll be very happy to have you come on back and give us uh, your next update. But in the meantime, thanks for coming on today and sharing your knowledge. So really Thank you so much, Linda and Heather. Absolutely. I'd love to update you on how this develops down the road and would love your expertise on once we get to those claims because you are the best in the market. So thank Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Please subscribe to our podcast series at Lowenstein.com backslash podcasts or find us on Amazon Music. Apple Podcasts, Audible, iHeartRadio, Spotify, SoundCloud, or YouTube. Lowenstein Sandler's podcast series is presented by Lowenstein Sandler and cannot be copied or rebroadcast without consent. The information provided is intended for a general audience and is not considered legal advice or a substitute for the advice of counsel. Prior results do not guarantee a similar outcome. Content reflects the personal views and opinions of the participants. No attorney-client relationship is being created by this podcast, and all rights are reserved.